I saw my mother raise a man from the dead. It still didn't help him much, my love. She told me, but I saw her do it all the same. That's how I knew she was magic. The time I saw my mama raise a man from the dead, it was close to dusk. Mama and her nurse, Lenore, were in her office. Mama with her little greasy glasses on the tip of her nose balancing the books and Lenore banking the fire. That was the rule in Mama's office. The fire was kept burning from dawn till after dinner and we never let it go out completely. Even on the hottest days when my linen collar stuck to the back of my neck and the belly of Lenore's apron was stained with sweat, a mess of logs and twigs was lit up down there, waiting. When the dead man came, it was spring. I was playing on the stoop. I'd broken a stick off the mulberry bush so young it had resisted the pull of my fist. I'd had to work for it. Once I'd wrench it off, I stripped the bark and rubbed the wet wood underneath on the flagstone, pressing the green into rock. I heard a rumbling come close and looked up, and I could see, down the road, a mule plodding slow and steady with a covered wagon, a ribbon of dust trailing behind it. In those days, the road to our house was narrow and only just cut through the brush. Our house was set back. Grandfather, my mother's father, had made his money raising pigs and kept the house and pens away from everyone else to protect his neighbors and his reputation from the undermining smell of swine. No one respects a man, no matter how rich and distinguished looking, who stinks of pig scat. The house was set up on a rise so we could always see who was coming. Usually it was mama's patience walking or limping or running to her office. Wagons were rare. When it first turned onto our road, the cart was moving slowly, but once it passed the bowed over walnut tree, the woman at the seat snapped her whip and the mule began to move a little faster until it was upon us. Where's your mother? I opened my mouth, but before I could call for her, my mother rushed to the door, Lenore behind her, quick was all mama said. And the woman came down off the seat. A boy about 12 or 13 followed. They were both dressed in mourning clothes. The woman's skirt was full, embroidered on the bodice of her dress were a dozen black lilies done in cord. The boy's mourning suit was dusty, but perfectly fit to his form. At his neck was a velvet bow tie come undone on the journey. The woman carried an enormous beaded handbag. It too was dusty, but looked rich. It was covered in a thousand little eyes of jet that winked at me in the last bit of sun. Go, Lenore, my mother said. And Lenore and the woman and the boy all went to the back of the wagon. The boy hopping up in the bed and pushing something that lay there, Lenore and the woman standing, arms ready to catch it. Finally, after much scraping, a coffin heaved out of the wagon bed. It was crudely made, a white bright wood, heavy enough that Lenore and the woman stumbled as they carried it. When the coffin passed me, I could smell the sawdust still on it. My mother stepped down off the stoop then, and the four of them lifted it up and managed it to the office. As soon as they got inside, they set it on the ground and pushed it home. I could hear through, I could hear the rough pine shuffling across the floor. You're early, Mama struggled with the box. Don't start with me, Kathy, the woman said. And Lenore looked up and so did I. No one except grandfather before he died dared call Mama Kathy. To everyone except for me, she was always doctor, but mama did not bristle and did not correct as she would have had with anyone else. Word was you be here at midnight. We couldn't leave, the woman said. He wasn't ready. The woman knelt down in her dusty skirts and drew a long skinny claw hammer from the handbag. She turned it on its head and began to pull at the nails on the coffin's face. She grunted, here, Lucian. She signaled to the boy, put some grease into it. He fell down beside her, took the hammer from her hands and began to pull at the nails she'd left behind. Mama watched eagerly, we all did. 
I crossed the room to stand beside her, slipped my hand into hers. Mama started at my touch. If you'd only come later. The woman's head jerked up and her expression sharp. And then she looked at my hands and Mama's and her frown softened. I know we've done it differently. This time we really tried, she said. Besides, my Lucian sees all this and more. If you do this work, Kathy, your children will know sooner or later. Mama did not take advice from anyone. Certainly not advice on me, but she said nothing at this softest of rebukes, only watched the woman and her son. The boy, Lucian, pulled hard, and when the final nail was out, he and Lenore pulled at the splintering plank until it gave a terrible yawn. And then I saw a man curled in on himself like a dried mulberry leaf, his skin gray, his eyes open and staring, his pants damp. He smelled sharp like the spirits Lenore used to cut Mama's medicines. The woman gasped and reached for the boy and held him close. Lenore gasped too. Mama let go of my hand and knelt down at the side of the coffin. She held her ear over the man's open mouth and her eyes went blank. That look she always got when she left this world and entered the one of her mind. She stood up suddenly. The Annika, please, she said to Lenore, who hurried to the shelf over Mama's work table. Lenore held the big glass jar close to her chest, then set it down beside the coffin. Without looking at her, never taking her eyes off the dead man, Mama held out her right hand. Thirty grains, she said. Exactly, don't skip me, girl. Lenore counted them out. One, two, three. I watched the yellow pellets move from the jar to Mama's open palm. Mama wet the fingers of her free hand with her spit, the better to, gra the better to gain purchase, and then pinched each grain one by one from her right palm and fed them into the dead man's mouth. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. He wasn't like that when we put him in, Kathy, the woman said. Lucian turned his face to her side, and I felt a flash of pride that a boy bigger than me couldn't watch what I could. 21, 22, 23. 30 seeds passed between his lips. The last five left them yellow. Mama stood up. The man lay still in his coffin. Mama put her hands on her hips, frowned. Then she knelt down suddenly and whacked his back. The man sputtered and coughed and made the lowest moaning sound. His eyes blinked and he rolled them up to look at all of us from his resting place. There, Mama said. The woman sighed. Kathy, I don't know what we would have done. Well, we don't have to wonder. Mama wiped her hands on her skirt. The man in the coffin was still groaning. He was so eager to keep going, the woman said. He and his sister came to us three days ago. He, he said he should leave before his sister, that he was strong enough to make it first. But when he saw how he had to come, he got scared. He was shaking something fierce. I told him me and my mom took a girl not but 10 years old this way, and she was brave and didn't cry the whole time, Lucian said. He was much recovered now and had stepped away from his mother's side. I said, be brave, Mr. Ben. Last night he disappeared, the woman said. That's why we left at the wrong time. He went missing and almost killed us all. He was down in Market Square begging for whiskey to help him through. I said, you fool, but he was already drunk by the time he got back. Pierre told me to wait till he sobered up, but if we'd done that, he would have kept yelling, drawing even more attention to us. It took Pierre and Lucian both to get him in the box. And the whole time he was hollering that we were trying to kill him. I kept saying, he kept saying, he kept saying, damn nigger, what I ever do to you? Mama started to laugh, but caught herself. Instead, she said, how did you get him to be so quiet? I soaked that rag in some laudanum and stuffed it in his mouth and then he fell right still. When we nailed the top on, I swear he was still breathing. Mama shook her head. You always overdo it, Elizabeth, she said. 
And then we all heard a great whoosh as Mr. Ben sat up in his coffin and began to cry, That black bitch right there promised to get me out. They all said she can get you out, but no one ever said it was like this in a goddamn coffin. Mr. Ben was upright, and I could see him clearly. The color came back to him. His skin was dark brown. I, I liked his face. It was soft and, I thought, handsome. Made more so by his cheeks and chin, they rounded into the pout of a spoiled and much-loved baby. I could not tell how old he was. His skin was smooth, but his hair, what was left of it, was turning gray and clipped close to his skull. He wore a graying shirt and breeches and no hat. His hands were enormous and calloused. He was crying loud, racking sobs that I did not think a grown person could make. He was no, he made no move to leave his coffin and my mother and the woman made no move to comfort him. The woman said, behave yourself, Mr. Ben. Mama pursed her lips. Is this, is this his final destination? We take his sister to Manhattan next month. Then perhaps Mr. Ben can wait for her there. Mr. Ben, Mama said, you will have to stay the night here, but I trust we can count on you to be quiet. Mr. Ben did not look at her. Instead, he gazed up at the ceiling. As long as I don't ever have to sleep in any coffin, Mama laughed. Only the good Lord can promise that. Mama had Lenore set up a bed for Mr. Ben by the fire, and she and the woman, Madam Elizabeth, she said to call her, took Mr. Ben by both elbows and helped him stand for the first time in 12 hours and walk around the room before settling down. Mr. Ben went easily enough to sleep, and Mama and Madam Elizabeth fell to talking. I was too cow to say anything to our visitors with the other people who came to see mom at the house, her patients and the runners from the pharmacy closer to town and all the women in the committees and societies and church groups mom headed. I had been trained to make polite conversation and ask, how do you do? But Madame Elizabeth was different. She spoke to mama as if we had not all just seen her raise a man from the dead, as if mama was the same as she, Kathy. She said when Mama stood over Lenore as she made up Mr. Ben's cot. You work this poor woman to death. As they talked, I did not dare to interrupt them. I did not want to be sent away to bed. Mama brewed strong sassafras tea for the both of them. They had seemed to agree without ever speaking it aloud that they would both stay up the night to make sure Mr. Ben made it. I sat very still and close to Mama, and the only way I was sure she had not forgotten me was when, after she finished her mug, she silently handed it to me because she knew that I believed that the sweetest drink in the world came from the dregs of a cup she had drunk from. From their talking, I learned that Madame Elizabeth was a childhood friend of Mama's. She had a husband whom she called Monsieur Pierre, a Haitian Negro, so you know he's unruly, Madame Elizabeth said, and Mama laughed. Oh, hush, she said. He and Madame Elizabeth owned a storefront down in Philadelphia. Madame Elizabeth ran a dressmaker's shop on one side of the house, and Monsieur Pierre ran an undertaker's on the other. You are doing so well, Mama asked, and Madame Elizabeth stood up, stamping her feet so her skirt hung down straight. Well, well, look at this dress, Madam Doctor. She turned. It was indeed a very fine dress. The lilies embroidered on the bodice stretched tendrils down to the skirt, a queer embellishment on a morning dress that she had clearly worn over many travels. You play too much, Mama said. A dress like that draws attention, and that's the last thing any of us need. We're doing the Lord's work in a cruel world, but that doesn't mean we can't do it with style, Madame Elizabeth said. Mama looked at the fire. If we are found out because you insist on introducing yourself, with an ostrich feather, I don't know that I or the Lord can forgive you. 
Well, ostrich feathers are declassé. Madame Elizabeth took the hem of her dress in her hand and artfully shook it. Pierre always hated them, and lo and behold, the ladies say they're no longer in fashion, so nothing to worry about on that account. They fell into a practice quarrel, one that must have been older than me, centered on Mama's bad dress sense. Mama did not care for beauty. This was true. Like all the women in our town, she dressed for work in heavy dark colored gowns that would bear the mark of other people's sweat and tears and spit and vomit and never show the stain. But where others took care to tie a scarf at an angle or thread sweet grass through a shirt cuff, Mama did not care. She was not scraggly. She was always neat. And on Sunday, she allowed for the vanity of a hat with a big sweeping brim, which was decorated with the same set of silk flowers she'd won in a church raffle before I was born. But when one of the ladies' group she belonged to would occasionally fall into a giddy talk about the newest bolt of fabric or a new way of tying a headscarf, she would always quickly steer the conversation back to what was at hand. She would have been mortified to know it, but I had heard some of the women point to those same silk flowers on her hat that had not changed position for many seasons and call them more reliable than springtime. Madame Elizabeth teased Mama about the cramped practicalities of their youth until finally she turned to me, the first she had acknowledged me since she came in. Do you know, do you, do you think she was always this way? She glanced sideways at my mother. <laughs> You turn my own daughter against me, Mama said, but she was laughing, really laughing in a way I had not heard before. When we were girls at the colored school, Madame Elizabeth leaned in her voice low as if I was as old as she and Mama. I used to be so terrible at arithmetic, but not her. She was the best at it. Oh, so quick. You'd think the devil was giving her notes. Elizabeth! But he wasn't, of course. She was just so smart, your mother. Smarter than the devil, but good. But not all the way good. Can I tell you? <laughs> Can I tell you a secret, my dear? Don't listen to her. Mama went to cover my ears, but Madame Elizabeth drew me to hear her and held me close to her lap and mock whispered loud enough for Mama to hear. Do you know what your clever Mama would do? She'd asked me to dye her ribbons purple for her. Yes, even your good and smart mama wanted a bit of purple ribbon. And me, being her bestest friend, being her kind Elizabeth, mashed up all the blackberries I could find and dyed those ribbons the prettiest purple anyone in Kings County had ever seen and extorted me and forced me to agree to do your arithmetic for you in exchange, Mama said. But can you blame me? Madame Elizabeth's breath was so soft on my ear, I shivered. Your Mama has always been the brightest. Madame Elizabeth stroked the plaits in my hair and ran her fingers over my brow. Lord, she said. Your girl may be dark, Kathy, but isn't she pretty? Liberty is beautiful, Mama said, gazing happily at me. And I flushed warm because Mama did not often comment on anyone's appearance, unless it was to note that their skin had gone jaundiced or developed a rash. It's a shame she got her father's color, Madame Elizabeth said absently, and Mama stopped smiling. It's a blessing, she said, very distinctly. And Madame Elizabeth's hands paused. You aren't scared, she said. She was stroking my face again. I did not want her to stop, but I could see from Mama's face that she wished that she would. This work grows more dangerous, you know. You are all right. You're bright enough. They hassle you less, maybe, but she's too dark. Mama stood up abruptly. It's less dangerous work if your help meets come to you at midnight as promised, not dusk, she said. She bent over Mr. Ben's cot. 
Madame Elizabeth let go of my face. I told you why we missed our time, but Mama didn't answer. She held her palm over Mr. Ben's open mouth. How is he? Madame Elizabeth called. If he makes it through the next hour without any upset, he should be recovered. Madame Elizabeth looked over at her son who had fallen asleep in Mama's leather examination chair. Lucian, like Madame Elizabeth, had brassy velvet skin and it was blushing now in the last heat of the fire. Lucian's good looking as well, Madame Elizabeth glanced sideways at Mama. Perhaps one day he and Liberty will make us proud and marry. Mama was still watching Mr. Ben, but she smiled. And move my Liberty all the way to Philadelphia away from me? I couldn't bear that, she said, but she was pleased. I could see that Madame Elizabeth, even in jest, considered me worthy of her son. What did Mama do with the purple ribbons? I asked before I could stop. I cursed myself. Surely now they would send me to bed, but Madame Elizabeth pulled me into her lap. She wore them every day because she knew they looked so fine. She was wearing them the day she met your good and kind father. She only let me borrow them once when I asked her because I was going to a lecture at the Lyceum and wouldn't you know, it was there where I met my own good man, Monsieur Pierre. He was fresh from Haiti, and I do believe meeting him is because of those lucky purple ribbons. Maybe she'll let you wear them one day, too, and you will tell us of finding your love with them. Tall tales, Mama said. The rope on the cot whinnied as Mr. Ben turned over in his sleep. He began to cry. He was saying something, a word gargled. Ma gently lifted his head, and he sighed and then shouted, Daisy! He certainly has given us work, Madame Elizabeth said. We grow too bold. You should not have taken him. He insisted in his state it's safer to keep him moving. Once his sister comes, she can take him on to Troy or Syracuse or Canada. He won't be safe till he's out of this country. Even then he will probably be in danger, Mama said. Daisy! Mr. Ben cried again. His sister said that was his girl. Madame Elizabeth said. He, he took up with her and, and then she ran. They got word last spring she died. That's what finally made him despair enough to leave, his sister said. She'd been trying to get him to work up the courage for forever. Their mother gone, brother gone, and then the girl he started to love for just a little bit of comfort gone too. That's why he's here. He's running away, not running towards. They're the most dangerous kind, Mama said. They have nothing to lose, so they grow reckless. He won't harm us, though. Let us hope, Mama said. She did not sound convinced. We all slept in the examination room that night, me curled on Mama's lap, and Madame Elizabeth and, Lu and Lucian collapsed on each other, and Mr. Ben still in his cot. Amazing, <laughs> yeah. girl! That was amazing. Oh my god! Now I want to now I want to actually just have you read the whole book to me. Please. That was wonderful, and everything that I've read already came so much to life. Okay, Caitlin, congratulations! Oh, sorry, Kara, go ahead. No, I just wanted to thank Caitlin for your incredible, beautiful words. I am absolutely moved, and it was just an excerpt. <laughs> um, and, and, and I just cannot wait to, to sink into this stunning, uh, literature. Well, thank you. Um, you know, you read it better than I ever could have. So thank you so much for that. That was like a real gift to, um, hear your work and your craft in, in reading that. So thank you so much. That was beautiful. Just stunning. It's yeah. amazing. Um, and I'm excited that you get to read the rest of this book as I am excited for everyone that's here. Caitlin, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I've been excited about this book. I have mine here, um, the beautiful hardcover. I've been excited about this book 
since you've been talking about it, but really I'm so happy for all the people that are going to get to read it now. Yeah. And of course I have a million questions. Um, but the first one that I wanted to ask you was where did the book start for you? Um, well, the story itself is based on the um, life story or part of the life story of Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, and she was the first Black female doctor in New York State. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a resident of Weeksville, which was a free Black community in central Brooklyn that was founded in 1838, basically as like a, a um, political voting block for Black people. Um, mm -hmm. At that time in New York State, you had to own a certain amount of land to vote. And so um, a group of black men got together, they sort of bought this large piece of land and then were selling it off to other black families. Mm -hmm. And um, that history is beautiful and wonderful. And it's all at the Weeksville Heritage Center, which is just a few miles from the Center for Fiction. Everybody should go visit it. Yep. Uh, Weeksville was my very first job when I moved to or, uh, New York City the second time, I should say. Um, <laughs> so uh, I moved to New York City and I, I, I just got to work there and it, it was a truly a life-changing experience. Um, I worked with some of the smartest, most creative people who have ever been in my life. Um, and one of the things that I did with them was I worked on their oral history program. And so um, we were talking to descendants of Weeksville, people whose um, family had lived there throughout sort of like the 200 year history of this space. Yep. And so one of the people we talked to was a descendant of Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, the first black female doctor in New York state, whose father had been one of the founders of Weeksville. Mm -hmm. And um, this descendant actually was an actress. Um, her name is Ellen Holly. If you watched soap operas in the 70s, she was on One Life to Live. I totally watched soap operas in the, wait, wait, okay, <laughs> go on. <laughs> Um, she's famous because she was in the first interracial kiss on daytime television. Her character was that she was playing a black woman who was passing as Italian in like a hospital. And then she had like this love affair and then it was like revealed she's actually black. Um, and she is an amazing writer and family historian herself. She wrote mm -hmm. her, uh, her memoir, which delves deep into her family history going back in like the 1790s. It's called One Life. I think it's oh still God. in print. Wow. Okay. She tells this whole story of Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart having this daughter named Anna who married into this prominent uh, black American expat family in Haiti. Um, the marriage sort of going south and then um, the doctor traveling to figure out how to smuggle her daughter and grandchildren out of the country to come back to the US which she was able to do um, kind of fantastically. She was able to smuggle them out and they settled in um, Cherry Hill, New Jersey and, and lived there for the rest of their days. But the, the uh, Anna had really sort of fond memories of Haiti and told her descendants constantly like, yes, I had to leave. Yes, this marriage was terrible, but um, I, I absolutely loved that country. And, and she had like very romantic remembrances, remembrances of it. Um, mm. And for her whole life, her, her in-laws in Haiti would write her letters sort of saying like, you have to come back here and um, you are, you, when you broke up this marriage, you are ruining the black race. Um, you're sort of proving wow. that black people can't have families when you do this, you're, you're absolutely sort of ruining this life of black exceptionalism that you've been raised into by, by breaking up this abusive marriage. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff was super fascinating and, and interesting to me. And you know, when you're a novelist and you hear a story like that, you're like, oh my goodness, that would make, great fiction um, and I would love to write it. And, and so um, I heard that story probably like 10 or 11 years ago now and sort of filed it away as, as you know, if I ever get a chance to write uh, many novels, I would, I would love to write one about this. And so that's where it came from originally. 10 or 11 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then wait, how long ago did you start actually writing it? I started um, writing this like a little bit in 2016 and then in, okay. and in earnest I started writing it probably in 2017 2018 yeah um, and uh so it was German germinating for a long time mm -hmm. and, you know, a big challenge for me was knowing that I wanted to set of course a huge part of the book in Haiti yeah in, um I hadn't visited there yet I don't speak French and I don't speak Creole so I was really just had a lot of trepidation about how to do that as a writer and 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 not only setting it in Haiti as a non-Haitian person, mm -hmm. but also setting it in Haiti um, from, you know, in a, in a time period um, that I didn't really have that much access to because, um, you know, a lot of 
even 10 years ago, a lot of the stuff that was being translated into English around Haitian history was around either the Haitian Revolution in, in the early 19th century or um, US occupation of Haiti in the early 20th century and not this time period in between, which would when I wanted to set it, which was like the 1870s and 1880s. So it was getting over a lot of that, um, you know, yeah. anxiety around how do you write into that space that feels like it could be really inaccessible and that you could get wrong um, really quickly. That means, I mean, that makes so much sense. And also just the, the nervousness of that moment, right? Like wanting to do it all right. And then the, and then the mechanism of fiction being that you have to kind of go forward and make the mistake. You have to imagine into the world and make the mistakes that you're going to make to find the right story, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's like the magic of getting to write fiction, right? Like you, you know, that there are certain things that you're just going to have to imagine um, and I'm like, if I was writing this as nonfiction or a piece of history or something, I can, you know, I have that space to hopefully expand into that and to, and to start to make those connections um, and imagination. Uh, but to get to that place where you feel comfortable enough, sort of like waiting out there with like no, you know, no anchor, yeah. sort of yeah. like floating around, it, <laughs> it takes a lot, you know? So. <laughs> Okay, wait, so I have a process question for you. This, this came up for me a lot when I was reading this because there is so much history in here and it's riveting and it's amazing. Sorry, that's Samuel L. Jackson who's also excited about your book. <laughs> um, the cat. Um, so because there is so much history and because you do it in this kind of beautiful way, I kept wondering, did you do the research and then do the writing or was it like, no, I'm going to start the writing. I'm going to have a little more research. I'm going to start the writing. I'm going to have a little more research because it's so flawlessly kind of hooked together. Um, I did, I did like a little bit of writing and a little bit of research. And when I first started out, I tried to think of, um, think of an anchor to sort of like tether me to something, which was, um, at the very, very beginning of this, I sort of said, well, what's a, what is a story line where I, so that I don't have to be inventing plot on top of, um, on top of research, on top of writing, on top of fi figuring out the yeah. voice for this particular character. Like, what is a storyline that I could borrow from to sort of like hang all this on? Mm -hmm. So in the, in the original part, it was, I'm going to base this on the Persephone myth, which, you know, is like Demeter is a, is, you know, a goddess sometimes a healing goddess and her daughter marries the son marries Hades and goes down onto the earth and she has to go get her and it's like you know foundational myth for yep. Greek mythology but also sort of across different cultures there are versions of this myth um and there are different parts of the myth that um make up different parts of plot like one of the parts of the myth is um that sometimes gets told is that uh, when Demeter is looking for her daughter, she goes and she finds these sphinxes, these singing sphinxes uh, who are the last people to see her and mm -hmm. they're able to tell her where to go. So I was like, okay, that's uh, a plot point that yep. I can hang something on yep. and can sort of let me expand and let me try and translate that into the logic of this world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another really fun part about that story that I got to work in is like, there's a, a part of the Demeter myth where she's still looking for, for Persephone and she, comes across, she's really, she's really sad, she's in grief, and she comes across like this, um, this woman, and the woman notices that she's sad, and to try and lift her grief, she opens up, she lifts her skirt, so that uh, Demeter can see her vagina, and yes. it makes her laugh, and yes. so like, that has to go into this. Clearly. <laughs> sort of way. So all of those things were really fun to like put in, and to figure out how to, how to go in, and then once you have, once you know that that scene has to somewhere be in there, then um, there's a, there's a bunch of research you can do to make that scene feel real to a reader and to logically make sense for these characters. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of like my shortcut was like, let me borrow from this other myth. Yeah, I can have something to work the research into, so I know what I'm trying to fit 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 it into. What I so I know what I'm trying to sort of do. Um, what what the container is going to look like to hold all this stuff. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, this is so exciting. I wish there was, I wish there was some way to read a book and then also have you whispering in my ear as I'm reading it. <laughs> it makes the book really exciting again. Um, so Liberty herself, when did that character come to you? She's not a typical, I know every book, you know, every review is going to talk about her as a heroine, but she's not a typical heroine, right? There's some way in which she's really working against something doing something very different. So how did that, how did that come to you? Um, I thought, you know, I was, I was writing towards this 
myth of uh, Black exceptionalism. You know, so much of how most people learn about Black history, if they do at all in this country, is through the exceptions. You know, like the first Black person to do X, the first Black woman to do X, and those are the stories usually that we get told, and we don't really get told like the stories of everyday people, sort of like what it was like to to live and to do things. And and so that means that for a lot of people, Black history is about a very particular um, the assumption is that Black history is only about a very particular type of adversity, which is an adversity in direct conflict and trying to get into white spaces. And of course, Black history is so much more expansive than that. You know, it's, um, there's, it is also the history of our own spaces. It has nothing to be or in conversation with whiteness in sort of like a larger way. So a big challenge to myself was to set this novel in the 19th century during the Civil War and Reconstruction with hopefully the um, tension of that larger historical moment, but not in direct um, confrontation with whiteness, except for sort of in very key moments for Liberty and her mother. Mm -hmm. And so when that tension is is taken away, then like what's gonna be the key tension for Liberty and, and, and from the beginning, um, you know, I worked in, I worked at Black History Sites for half of my professional life for about like 10 years in total. Um, and from the beginning, whenever I was sort of like working in those spaces, the biggest question to me was always like, what about the people who are just living their lives and like did not necessarily want to engage with yeah, this larger strife? Yeah. Um, and what about the people who also felt like they weren't living up to sort of the ideal of like struggle, struggle, struggle all the time? Like what were those people doing in the 19th century that, that they get, they don't get left out of the historical record, but they are, because of our orientation of what we think is the, is, is the one story of Black history, their stories just don't get told as much um, when those st their stories are sure the majority of stuff. So mm -hmm. really liberty sort of comes from like, what would it feel like to be among the first um, generation of people free um, mm -hmm. and you are surrounded by people doing absolutely extraordinary acts and you're appreciative of them, you understand what they are, but you also just wanna like live your life and not necessarily like, um, engage in those in those other things and you're you're trying to figure out what your relationship is to all of those all of those things yeah yeah that's um i just want to remind people that you can ask questions in the q a if you have them and i will get to them um in a minute but you actually hit on something that i was really wanted to know about which is that the the rupture between liberty and her mother it feels both timeless in a way right it's very recognizable um and then there's something about the, the loaded moment that they're having this rupture, which feels especially fraught. I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it is a it is a rupture around sort of like, what do you actually do with your freedom for yourself? And they have very different ideas about what that is. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, Liberty's mother has like a very narrow understanding of what you're supposed to do with freedom. Um, and how you're supposed to serve other people. And Liberty knows enough that she doesn't know, that she doesn't want her mother's um, uh, definition to be her own, but she doesn't know enough about the world to really know what her replacement definition would be. She's in very, in many ways, extremely sheltered. And um, in many ways, she's like an extremely privileged person. I mean, she's free born. She's never lived in slavery. Um, and her mother is a doctor and she lives in relative um, uh, sort of uh, comfort and ease. Yeah. Um, and she's expecting to marry into this sort of tiny black elite that emerged after the civil war. Um, mm -hmm. And she's, you know, she's trying to uh, define herself around those things, which I think is, is the, where her larger, I guess, sense of character comes from is is um you know like continual self-definition like a big um inspiration for her is uh there's like a uh Toni Bambara talks in one of her books about how um when she was a kid she would lie on the kitchen floor and her mother would mop around her um and not disturb her when she was lying on the kitchen floor and let her just imagine while she was sort of doing this work Amazing. yeah and so that was sort of like a real, like that image was a real sort of like touchstone of what their relationship would be like uh -huh. um, and what, uh, and how sort of like Liberty experiences that. Wow. Okay, so you are um, yourself, you are from a family of geniuses, 
um, you've got Kristen, who's the playwright, and Carrie, who's the academic and historian, and your mother. And okay, is there any part of being from a family of geniuses that's like terrible? Asks your kind of jealous friend. <laughs> all of it growing up, you know, it's like you when you're the youngest, it off it's it's really hard to figure out how you're going to fit into all of that. And, you know, my family still thinks of me, I think, as a screw up in a lot of ways. So you know, I still have that uh, reputation. So, you know, it's like the the level of expectation of what you're supposed to put out and, and how you're supposed to work is very skewed and not always in like great ways. Um, and so there's a continual need to self define for yourself what um what's your own version of sort of success is going to look like i guess and did you always know um uh, in this in this family did you always know that you wanted to be a writer um yes and no i mean i wrote a lot from a young age and and was sort of involved in in writing communities from a really young age um but the idea of being a writer full-time because my my sisters were sort of involved with it I didn't want to do it for my like right away for my whole life. Like it felt like I would run out of steam really quickly if I sort of did if I if I went straight for it. And it felt like it was easier to sort of do it from a from a slant and sort of oh. be in other things and then sort of like come in come at it from a, a slanted position. Um, so like in college, I didn't do any writing courses until my, the very last semester of my senior year when Alex mm -hmm. was um, teaching nonfiction at Amazing. Wesleyan, which was, I'm so grateful that I took a class with him. Um, I can imagine. That must have been yeah. amazing, right? <laughs> Wait, that was your last year there? That was my last, yeah, last year, final semester there, I took a class Santa. with him, yeah. um, which I'm so, so grateful for. Uh, and I sort of didn't really want to be in, I guess, you know, I, I avoided writing spaces for uh, for what felt like a long time, but actually probably wasn't really that long time, but it, it felt like a long time of avoiding fully immersing myself in those spaces just because it felt like um, there was too much for myself sort of riding on it and it was better mm -hmm. to have an understanding of myself outside of writing. It's always good to have an escape plan, I guess, is the way to to put it. <clears throat> Yeah, and it's also that thing of when you know you really want something, it's almost impossible to walk right toward it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So like exactly. Some part of you is like, you know. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly. Exactly. To dodge it. Um. All right. We have two um questions in the chat. I'm gonna. Okay. Thank you so much for writing this book and for being here. This is from Joy Wang. I was wondering how the BLM movement impacted your creative process, assuming that you were writing it in parallel to the protests happening across the country and around the globe. How did these live events unfolding enter into that fictional space or did they? Um, you know, probably the biggest influence on this was knowing that, you know, so many people before me have said this, um, you know, starting in like 2014, 2015 is that mm -hmm. we are, we're living through essentially a second reconstruction. Like we're living through a period of intense, um, uh, uh, like, visibility of of black achievement in this country and then we're also living through a period of just uh heightened white violence against really anybody and anything both mm -hmm. physical violence and then also just um you know legal repression um and it's it's a real whiplash of of living through it of how do you counter or understand a reality in which you know um uh, I'll just use the world of writing in which, you know, every major publisher has basically remade their executive level staff to reflect Black people and people of color in a way that it has never had before. Right. And also, we don't have voting rights in Georgia anymore. Like, how do you reconcile those two things yeah. Yeah. that are happening at, at the exact same time? Um, and that many people try to say one somehow makes up for the other, which we know that's not the case. Right. Um, and uh, and how do you, as an individual, like continue to um, pursue your own life through all of those things, your own regular life that you're going to keep pursuing of, you know, making friends and, and, and going out and having interest in doing all those other things that happen sort of during these big historical moments. So in that way, I would say that that's how this book is in conversation with 
um, that sort of uh, movement and, and conversation. And I think, you know, so much of our language now mirrors the language then, like, even when you're talking about like like our current language of woke, like in 1850, whatever, there was a whole group called the Wide Awakes who were progressive people who wanted to see an end to slavery and uh, general like economic whatever. So like even just down to like those sorts of like things of, of yeah. mirror things, it really is a mirror image of our own time. And so um, seeing what was happening around those protests really led me to dig deeper into um, this particular historical period. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Dara Williams is asking, did you interview anyone from the Black elite, a descendant of the first Black families? Likewise, did you interview any Haitian elite? So I, the one interview that I did was Ellen Holly. Um, and so we, it was a really beautiful interview in that she's, she's a trained actress. So um, she's able to tell a story very well. And she sort of has like that old black Hollywood, boy. like it sounds like Lena Horne is sort of like whispering in your ear. It's really beautiful. Oh, wow. Um, and, <laughs> and she told like this very captivating story and, and her politics are very similar to mine in that she's sort of like, you know, the, she was, she was able to break down what it would have meant for this woman to leave her marriage at that time. And she was able to break mm -hmm. down how um, damaging the ethos of the black elite at that time was towards sort of any sort of individual happiness and um, how much of it was invested in making sure that you were always and forever an example for others. And you like, like the, the, the breathing room for um, making a mistake or making um, or messing up in some sort of way was non-existent. And so like, what would that pressure have been like to live under that? She was very, right. very um, sensitive to that and very, very, um, and was able to speak really eloquently about that. Um, and so she was probably my one interview. And then I wasn't really able to interview other descendants at all, um, uh, which is kind of sad, but mostly I was reading letters from the time period and um, some memoirs. I was reading less, um, Haitian elite memoirs and more letters from black expatriates who were going to Haiti in the 1870s, 80s and 90s and writing, black, and writing back to black American newspapers. Um, and they're talking about how they were trying to establish different churches in Haiti um, and mm -hmm. sort of like what they were, what they were thinking about the country. Oh my God, that must have been amazing. Um, we have a related question actually, which is um, Kiki is asking, Caitlin, how did you know when it was time to stop with the research and dive into the writing? Um, you know, I think anytime a piece of research really made me very excited and I just got really um, uh, interested in it and I, and I didn't, couldn't really explain why um, it was com completely interesting to me then I knew that it had to be something to go into the book. And then that means like figuring out the logic of for a reader to understand why that thing was going to be in the book or why that thing was going to um, be a plot point. So really it was just sort of like following my own curiosity and being pretty fine tuned to um, when something was really entering into my imagination versus when I'm just sort of like reading something to get a grounding and sort of like understand what the world is versus when something is really um, peaking some sort of uh, larger interest or, or piece of imagination. Yeah. Did you ever, did you ever worry like, oh, I'm hiding in the research now. I got to get back to the writing. Um, not really. I don't think I so. Think. Cause like it, it, it was more, you know, I like doing research, but I like research about um, less like I like research about odd things. So I'm yeah. not really one to be like, let, let me, let me read like the linear history of something like I, I respond more to um, like a linear things or things that are just sort of like this weird small thing, some weird small piece of cultural history is a larger comment about whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, that makes it easier to stop because I'm not really like one to read like all the battles of whatever and, and get lost in that kind of thing, so. Um, it's really funny because as you're saying that, I'm thinking of um, my general conversations with you in which there's, you. I feel like it's like you've got a bunch of marbles in your pocket and they are all these little moments where you're like, and by the way, this happened and it's a little piece of magical history that puts everything that we're talking about into context so I can see how it works. Um, okay, um, 
Margaret is asking, can you talk about Brooklyn and Weeksville as a character in the novel? Sure. Um, so I, um, you know, I, I absolutely adore uh, the Weeksville Heritage Center and the history that's there. And, and I really wanted to sort of explore what it would have been like to live in that community. And that history is so rich and strange and um, both like affirms so much that you understand about our current moment and then also like is counter to it. Um, and studying it is just proof that like nothing we're doing now is is in any way new or innovative or in, like mm. people are doing what we're doing now for literally mm. hundreds of years. And, and so um, I just really love that part of the history and wanted to explore it. And, and um, it's fun to write about, uh, you know, it's when I write sort of fiction that's set in the present day, it's, it's always sometimes really intimidating to set things in New York because some, there's so many versions of New York on the page and people are very yeah. territorial about New York on the page and it's and uh, people are always sort of like looking to figure out if you've gotten New York right or not and so it was really freeing to get to write about a version of New York that um, felt like there was still room to sort of play in and to um, and to uh, come up with um, ideas around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um James is asking, um, did you guys coordinate your outfits? And I just want to go ahead and say we did not. We, we did not. I noticed. Yes, it's matching. <laughs> I think it's the full, I have to say, I think it's like the Caitlin that's radiating through the ether and it just, and it just got to me. Because before I, I was like, I was in a sweatshirt and all of a sudden I was like, I must turn it up in black and white. Um, all right, we are almost out of time, but I, Caitlin, I, I thought I would take this opportunity to ask you a lot of weird questions that I've just yes. always wanted to know the answer about for you. So book you find yourself rereading re most often? Oh, um, let me think about that. What do I reread a lot? That's a hard one. Um, I think, I, well, this, during the pandemic, I reread um, Love in the Time of Cholera a bunch of times because it was very comforting to read and you can sort of dip in and out and it was the perfect, you know, it's the type of book that you can read where you can be paying very, very close attention. It's very rich and rewarding, or you can just be sort of like floating along on, on sort of everything. And yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a perfect form of attention. It was a perfect level of attention for every version of the pandemic for when like you just want to go deep <laughs> and not pay attention to anything when you just want to like skim along. It was yeah. very well for both of those things. Oh my God, I love that. Okay, period of time that you would like to travel back to provided you are in the bubble of safety and you are okay. <laughs> Because I always have to tell myself that whenever someone says you're going to travel back, I'm like, well, first of all, is there going to be a hair remover? And second of all, is my body going to be okay? So like you're in the bubble of safety. Um, I would probably like to go back to like the very, like the, the first years of Fela Kuti's like club in, in Lagos and just hang out there. I wouldn't want to be one of his wives, but I would want to be adjacent to that, I guess, just like get to hang out and dance. But maybe not participate in the marriage part of it. But <laughs> <laughs> Wife adjacent. I like that. I like that. Okay. First meal that you're going to go eat when it's safe to do such things. Oh, we were just talking about this. You're going to have tequila and oysters. That's probably the one with number me. one. With me. Yes, with you. Yes, with you. <laughs> yeah. um, number one, I think, you know, it's really hard to replicate oysters in pandemic, or at least for me it is. Yeah. Um, I think like last June, my sister and I were like, let's just go let's spend like $300 on getting oysters gotten. Like if we each put in $50, it'll be worth it, right? And then like somebody, one of us will like just watch a YouTube video about how to open it and it'll be oh, totally no. worth it. It was like, this is a terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like you're just gonna lose that thumb. There's no, there's no way to do this right. Okay, <laughs> television show you would want to write for? Television show I want to write for? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, hmm. What were you just watching in our family? Um, we got really into the flight attendant a few weeks ago. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And my niece and I. And so it would be really fun to write for that show, I think. Yeah, yeah that's it is. It's fast in all the all the plot points. Yeah. Um, and funny, right? Funny about death. Yeah. Um, all right. What television show would you want to be a side character on if you could be? 
Like, you know, if you're going to make a cameo in a life, right? If you could just kind of dip into a life and be a thing on a show ever? No, never thought. Um, hmm. Let me think about that one. What's I'm gonna think of a show that I watch over and over again. I think I watch New Girl a lot, so maybe like the the second season. Let's say second season of New Girl. I will drop in that character. That's pretty amazing. All right, and my last my last song, my last question for you, which is, what song do you listen to when you need to feel good? Oh, um, God, whatever good is for you. Like whatever, you know what I mean? Like whatever that constitutes for me, it's like, am I awake? Is that good? Am I in my body? Great. Oh, wait, my, my friend Margaret just texted me to say that the correct answer to the TV show question is Real Housewives of New York. And she's correct. So <laughs> she is totally correct. <laughs> Margaret calling you out live right here. Yep. Right. You're right, Margaret. It would be Real Housewives of New York. Um. Uh. Okay, so I think well, the only, the song that I listen to the most right now is How Far I'll Go from Moana. So I will answer that because we listen to that probably like, I don't know, a hundred times a day. And now we have the doll that sings it. So we don't even have to put it on TV. You just press the doll's button and she sings it. And I do, I sing it every single time with uh, my daughter. And so I, it does make me really happy to just do a Broadway belt out with her. Like, ah, oh, that's amazing. All right. Well, um, we are out of time, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for giving us this book. It's amazing. I'm thank so you. happy and I'm so excited to uh, celebrate tonight with you. Thank you, yes. Huge congratulations, Caitlin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mira, for joining us as well. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, make sure you buy the book. We'll drop the link in the chat again. Uh, and enjoy reading it. I'm sure you will. It's beautiful. Uh, again, congratulations and good night, everyone.